ever feel like there's more to reality than uh, meets the eye. Yeah, I think a lot of us do. Well, we're in luck because today we're diving deep into the mind of Dr. Miki Okaku. A physicist who's not afraid to tackle the uh, the really big questions. The really big mind-bending questions about the universe. We're talking parallel universes. Armholes. And even the possibility of time travel. Dr. Kaku thinks there's more to reality, too, and he's got the physics to back it up. Yeah, and what's fascinating is he doesn't just throw these wild concepts out there. Right. He uh, connects them to actual scientific research. Yeah, exactly. Makes even the most outlandish ideas feel strangely plausible. He was even voted one of the top 100 smartest New Yorkers. That's saying something. I know, right? And his books, like uh, Hyperspace and Visions, really delve into the deep end of theoretical physics. Yeah, they're great. We've got a stack of sources to explore today, so get ready for a wild ride. Okay, so where do we even begin with someone like Dr. Kaku? Well, he starts with one of the biggest mysteries in physics, how to unify the four fundamental forces of the universe. Okay, and those are? Gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. Right, right, the forces that govern everything in the universe. Yeah, but here's the thing, they seem to operate by different rules. And physicists have been struggling to find a single theory that explains how they all fit together. It's like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle. Where the pieces don't quite match up. Exactly. And Einstein himself spent decades trying to find this theory of everything. But never quite cracked it. So how does Dr. Kaku approach this puzzle? Well, that's where string theory and the concept of hyperspace come into play. Okay, I've heard of string theory. But right? hyperspace. It's pretty mind-blowing. String theory suggests that the universe isn't limited to the three spatial dimensions that we experience. You mean like length, width, and height? Right. But instead has ten dimensions in total. Ten dimensions. Ten. I know. It's hard to wrap your head around. I can barely wrap my head around four, and that includes time. Think of it like this. Imagine a fish living in a pond. Okay. Its whole world is two-dimensional. Forward, backward, left and right. Exactly. It can't even fathom the concept of up because that exists in a third dimension beyond its perception. I see. So we're like the fish. Dr. Kaku even says, we are the fish, to emphasize this point. Wow. So we're basically swimming around in our three-dimensional pond, completely oblivious to the higher dimensions that might be all around us. It's like living in the matrix, but instead of being plugged into a computer simulation, we're limited by our own senses. So if we could access these higher dimensions, what would that even mean? Well, Dr. Kaku suggests that it could explain things that we currently dismiss as paranormal. Like uh, like walking through walls. Exactly. Or objects suddenly disappearing and reappearing. Right. If we could manipulate higher dimensions, we could fold space like a piece of paper. Creating shortcuts between distant points. Exactly. Think of the wormholes in Stargate. Or the interdimensional travel and contact. Yeah. What if those seemingly impossible feats are simply glimpses into a reality beyond our current understanding? Okay, that's a pretty mind-blowing thought. But don't we need an insane amount of energy to even think about accessing hyperspace? You're telling me. Hmm. Like, more energy than our entire planet can produce. Yeah, something like that. You're not wrong. Dr. Kaku estimates that we'd need quadrillions of times more energy than what our most powerful particle accelerators can generate. And remember, the super collider was canceled because it was too expensive and complex. Exactly. So we're talking about energy levels that are way beyond our current capabilities. But what if there are civilizations out there that have already figured this out? Hmm. Civilizations that have mastered the energy of their planet, their star, or even their entire galaxy. That's where the Kardashev scale comes in. The Kardashev scale. Yeah, it's a way of classifying civilizations based on their energy consumption and technological advancement. Okay, so give us the breakdown. What are the different levels on this scale? Well, a type one civilization, uh, they control the energy resources of their entire planet. So they can harness the power of things like volcanoes, weather systems, earthquakes. Exactly, basically they've become masters of their planetary domain. That sounds pretty awesome. Sign me up. Uh, don't get too excited just yet. We humans, we're currently languishing as a type zero civilization. Like zero. That's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, we're still dependent on burning dead plants, fossil fuels for energy. So we've got a long way to go. What about the higher levels? 
Okay, so type two civilizations, they're the stellar masters. They've graduated from planetary energy to harnessing the power of their star. Imagine being able to siphon energy directly from the sun. Right, they're like the Federation in Star Trek, able to travel between stars and manipulate energy on a grand scale. And then there are the type three civilizations. Mm -hmm the ones who control the energy of an entire galaxy. Those are the big leagues. They're like the Borg assimilating entire worlds, bending galaxies to their will. Okay, so that's the ultimate goal, right? To become a type three civilization. Maybe, but here's the sobering part. Dr. Kaku believes that many civilizations might self-destruct before they even reach type one status. And why is that? Often due to things like nuclear war or environmental collapse. It's like we have all this potential, but we're also our own worst enemy. He even says that our generation is crucial in determining whether humanity makes it to the next level or goes the way of the dinosaurs. Kind of makes you think twice about those climate change warnings, doesn't it? It definitely puts things into perspective. And this connects to the idea of the great filter. The great filter. It suggests that there might be obstacles that prevent most civilizations from reaching higher levels of development. Maybe there's a universal tendency for intelligent life to destroy itself before reaching its full potential. So the question is, can humanity break through this filter? Can we learn from the hypothetical mistakes of those who came before us and create a sustainable future for ourselves and our planet? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It really is. And while we ponder that, there's another fascinating aspect of Dr. Kaku's work that I think we should explore. He's got some interesting thoughts about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. SETI? The search for aliens. The one and only. So, do you think we're going about it the right way? Well, most SETI efforts focus on searching for radio signals from space, right? Yeah. But Dr. Kaku argues that we might be listening in the wrong way. In the wrong way. How so? He compares it to looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay. Only we're looking for a specific type of needle. And maybe the aliens are using entirely different tools to communicate. It's like trying to contact someone in a foreign country by shouting English phrases louder and louder. Exactly. They might not even understand the concept of language as we know it. Let alone the specific words we're using. So what does Dr. Kaku suggest we do instead? He suggests that advanced civilizations might be using something akin to a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform. Yeah. It's a mathematical tool that spreads a signal across the entire electromagnetic spectrum to avoid interference. So instead of sending a concentrated signal on a single frequency, we should be looking for something more spread out. Exactly. Think of it like taking a beautiful, complex symphony and spreading it out across all radio frequencies, making it almost impossible to detect unless you know exactly what you're looking for and how to reassemble the signal. So we can be surrounded by alien signals, but we're basically listening with the wrong ears. It's like having a party going on right next door, but we're wearing noise-canceling headphones tuned to a completely different station. That's an interesting way to put it. It makes you wonder if we're missing an entire cosmic conversation simply because we're not listening in the right way. It really does, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. No. Before we can decode alien messages, maybe we should try to understand something a bit closer to home, yet just as mysterious. What? Black holes. Dr. Kaku has some fascinating insights about those too. Yeah, black holes are definitely mysterious mm -hmm. and a little bit scary, to be honest. I know, right. But from what I remember, they're often depicted as these infinitely dense points in space that suck everything in. Kind of like cosmic vacuum cleaners. Exactly. But Dr. Kaku challenges this common perception. Oh, how so? Well, he points out that recent observations have shown that black holes actually rotate. And this rotation leads to a fascinating phenomenon. Hold on. Are you saying that black holes aren't just points? They're, uh, they're spinning. Spinning? What does that even look like? Well, instead of collapsing into an infinitely dense point, a rotating black hole actually collapses into a ring. A ring? A ring. Dr. Kaku even describes it as a ring of fire, a ring of neutrons. Wow, that's an image that'll stick with me. Imagine a swirling vortex of unimaginable energy compressed into a ring-shaped singularity. But what's so significant about this ring structure? Well, some theories suggest that this ring could act as a gateway or a wormhole connecting to distant parts of the universe or even to other dimensions. So these monstrous, terrifying black holes could actually be portals to other realms. It's definitely one of those truth is stranger than fiction moments. Mm. And speaking of mind-bending concepts, Dr. Kaku also delves into the possibility of time travel. Time travel. 
Okay, now we're getting into some serious back to the future territory. He suggests that if wormholes exist, they might allow us to traverse not just space, but also time itself. But time travel is riddled with paradoxes, right? Paradoxes galore. Like what happens if you go back in time and accidentally kill your grandfather before your father's even born? The classic grandfather paradox. Would you cease to exist? Well, Dr. Kaku offers a solution based on the mind-bending concept of parallel universes. Parallel universes. Parallel universe. Okay, I'm all ears. Are we talking about alternate realities where things played out differently? Like in one universe, I'm a podcast host, and in another, I'm a rock star. Something like that, yeah. Dr. Kaku suggests that traveling back in time wouldn't necessarily alter your original timeline, but instead create a split, leading to a new universe where the alteration occurred. So you wouldn't disappear from your original timeline. You'd essentially create a new branch of reality okay. where your grandfather was killed mm -hmm. and the consequences of that action played out. Exactly. So instead of erasing myself from existence, I just create a new universe where I never existed in the first place. Yeah. It's like those choose your own adventure books, but on a cosmic scale. That's a pretty wild concept. It's both fascinating and a bit terrifying. It certainly challenges our conventional understanding of time and causality. But even if we could create wormholes and manipulate space-time, there's another huge hurdle we'd need to overcome. What's that? We'd need to find something called exotic matter. Exotic matter? Exotic matter. It's a hypothetical type of matter that has negative energy. Negative energy. Negative energy. Physicist Kip Thorne, who actually consulted on the movie Contact, proposed that exotic matter could be used to stabilize wormholes make them traversable. So we're talking about a substance that defies our current understanding of physics. It's like finding the missing ingredient for a recipe that might unlock time travel. But where would we even begin to look for something like that? That's the challenge. Exotic matter has never been observed. It's purely theoretical at this point. Mm -hmm. And it would behave in ways that seem counterintuitive, like falling up instead of down. Falling up? Up. So finding exotic matter would be a game changer, not only for our understanding of the universe, but also for the possibilities of interstellar travel and maybe even time manipulation. Oh, absolutely. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It sounds like we're a long way from building a real-life Stargate. A long way indeed. Mm -hmm. But while the search for exotic matter continues, there's another fascinating frontier that Dr. Kaku explores. The rapid advancements in genetics and the potential to transform humanity itself. Okay, now we're moving from the cosmic to the microscopic. But this is where science fiction starts to feel a lot like reality, isn't it? It really does. Dr. Kaku predicts that within a few decades, we'll have the ability to manipulate our own DNA, opening up possibilities that are both exciting and potentially terrifying. We're already seeing the early stages of this with gene editing technologies like CRISPR, which allows scientists to precisely alter DNA sequences. Imagine being able to eradicate genetic diseases, uh, grow new organs, mm -hmm. or even enhance human capabilities. It's incredible, isn't it? It is. But hold on a second. Isn't there a dark side to this? What about the ethical implications of manipulating our own genes? That's a critical question, and Dr. Kaku doesn't shy away from it. He acknowledges the ethical dilemmas that come with this level of control over our own biology. Like, what does it mean for humanity when we have the power to alter our genetic code? Mm. What are the potential risks and unintended consequences? Exactly. It's like opening Pandora's box. On the one hand, we could create a world free of suffering and disease. Right. But on the other hand, we could end up creating a society where only the genetically privileged have access to the best health care and opportunities. We've seen this play out in countless science fiction stories, and it rarely ends well. Oh, I know. Think Gataka or even Brave New World. Exactly. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. And we need to be incredibly careful about how we wield this power. Absolutely. But before we get too deep into the ethics of genetic engineering, there's another aspect of Dr. Kaku's work that I think we should discuss. Go on. He's been a vocal critic of certain scientific endeavors, even those with noble intentions, like the Cassini mission to Saturn. Cassini? Wasn't that a hugely successful mission? What's the problem with that? Well, Cassini relied on plutonium as a power source, which yeah. Dr. Kaku believes was an unnecessary risk. Plutonium. That sounds dangerous. It is. He argues that NASA safety calculations underestimated the potential consequences of an accident involving 72 pounds of plutonium. 72 pounds of plutonium. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. He even suggested that solar-powered probes, while perhaps needing to be smaller, would have been a far safer alternative. So he's concerned about the potential for catastrophic accidents. 
even in missions designed to expand our knowledge of the universe. His critique highlights the delicate balance between scientific progress and responsible risk assessment. It's a reminder that even with the best intentions, scientific advancements can have unintended consequences. And sometimes the risks might outweigh the potential rewards. It's a debate that will likely continue as we push the boundaries of science and technology. Absolutely. And it's a debate that we need to have openly and honestly if we want to ensure that our pursuit of knowledge doesn't come at too high a price. It's a lot to think about. It really is. But let's take a breath for a moment and process everything we've just explored. We've covered a lot of ground, from the mind-bending possibilities of hyperspace to the very real ethical challenges posed by advancements in genetics. And we're not done yet. There's so much more to unpack with Dr. Kakin's ideas. I know, it's exciting, but I think it's a good place to pause for now. All right, sounds good. Wait, what? Welcome back to our deep dive into the mind of Dr. Mikio Kaku. It's great to be back. Last time, we left off talking about that delicate balance between scientific progress and uh, responsible risk assessment. Right, especially when dealing with these incredibly powerful technologies that are emerging. Exactly, and it leads us to another fascinating and perhaps even more controversial aspect of Dr. Kaku's work. Oh, which is? His exploration of the potential for time travel. Okay, back to the, back to the future like stuff. Going back in time. But didn't we say that time travel is riddled with paradoxes? Oh yeah, paradoxes galore. Like the whole uh, grandfather paradox thing. Right, it seems logically impossible to go back in time and change the past in a way that would prevent your own existence. Exactly. But Dr. Kaku, he, uh, he doesn't let these paradoxes deter him. Of course not. He's Dr. Kaku, so what does he say? He offers a mind-bending solution, yeah. parallel universes. Okay, remind me again how this works. All right, so imagine like an infinite number of soap bubbles, right. each one representing a different universe with its own unique set of events, possibilities, you name it. Okay, so in one universe, I'm a podcast host. Right. In another, I'm, uh, I don't know, a world-famous chef. Exactly. So if I were to travel back in time, and change something significant, mm. I wouldn't be altering my own past, right? Right. Instead, I'd be creating a whole new universe. A new bubble branching off from the original. Well, those changes playing out in that new universe. Precisely. You wouldn't cease to exist in your original timeline. You'd simply be shifting your consciousness into a new timeline, a new universe where the consequences of your actions unfold. It's like hitting the reset button on reality, but only for yourself. So everyone else in my original timeline would just keep on going like nothing happened. Exactly. They'd have no idea. Wow. That's a pretty head-spinning concept. So changing the past wouldn't erase me from existence, mm -hmm. but it could create an entirely new universe. It's both mind-boggling and a bit terrifying. It certainly challenges our conventional understanding of time and causality. It suggests that time might not be a linear progression at all, Yeah. but more like a branching tree with infinite possibilities unfolding across multiple realities. Exactly. It's like those uh, choose-your-own-adventure books. Oh, I loved those as a kid. Me too. But, uh, you know, on a cosmic scale... Every decision, every action, could potentially create a split in the timeline leading to a new universe. Exactly. It's a concept that has fascinated science fiction writers for decades, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Like, think of the, uh, the Mirror Universe in Star Trek where characters have evil twins with goatees. Oh, yeah, the goatees. Or the branching timelines in the Back to the Future sequels. It's a classic. But let's not forget that all this talk about time travel and manipulating space-time, it's yeah. still very much in the realm of theoretical physics. Right. We're a long way from building a time machine. We're not going to be hopping into a DeLorean anytime soon. Not quite yet. And didn't we say we'd need to find something called exotic matter to even consider creating wormholes? Oh, yeah. Exotic matter. Which, you know, is purely hypothetical at this point. Right. It's this incredibly rare, possibly non-existent substance. Which is believed to have negative energy. Negative energy. Negative. And it's thought to be essential for stabilizing those wormholes, making them traversable. So it's kind of like the ultimate MacGuffin in the quest for time travel. That's one way to look at it. But while the search for exotic matter continues, there are other intriguing possibilities that Dr. Kaku explores. Like what? He points out that the mathematics of rotating black holes mm -hmm. suggests that they could potentially act as gateways to other points in space and time. Wait, are you saying that black holes, those terrifying cosmic monsters, mm -hmm. might actually hold the key to time travel? 
That seems, well, counterintuitive. It's definitely one of those what doesn't kill you makes you stronger situations. I guess so. Yeah. But remember, we said that rotating black holes don't collapse into a point. They collapse into a ring. Right. That ring of fire, a ring of neutrons, as Dr. Kaku put it. Such a great description. It's an image that I just can't shake. I know. Well, some theories suggest that this ring, it, uh, it could act as a kind of cosmic shortcut. A shortcut. A wormhole. That connects to distant parts of the universe, or even to other points in time. So we could potentially dive into a black hole and come out in a completely different place in time. It's some serious interstellar level stuff. That's incredible. It certainly stretches the boundaries of imagination. It does, but it's grounded in real, albeit highly speculative, physics. Right, right. But let's step back from the event horizon for a moment, shall it we? Sounds good to me. And, uh, and talk about something a bit closer to home both literally and figuratively. Oh, what's that? Dr. Kaku's concerns about humanity's future. Okay, so from black holes to the fate of humanity. It might seem like a jump. It is. But they are connected in a way. Uh, well, Dr. Kaku believes that our current generation is at a crossroads, facing challenges that could either propel us toward a brighter future or lead to our downfall. It's a pretty stark choice. So it's not just climate change or nuclear war he's worried about. Those are certainly part of the equation. Yeah. But he also points to the rapid advancement in technology. Okay. Particularly in fields like genetics and artificial intelligence. Right. As both a source of great promise mm -hmm. and potential peril. It's that double-edged sword again. Exactly. So, like, we were talking earlier about the potential of genetic engineering. Be to eradicate diseases yeah. and enhance human capabilities. Right. But it also raises some serious ethical questions about designer babies, genetic inequality, and the very definition of what it means to be human. It's like every technological lead forward comes with its own set of ethical dilemmas and potential downsides. Absolutely. It's like we're constantly teetering on the edge of a precipice, not sure if we're going to soar to new heights or plummet into the abyss. And Dr. Kaku, he, uh, he uses a powerful analogy to illustrate this point. What's that? He compares our current situation to a type zero civilization discovering element 92. Element 92? Uranium. Oh, right. The stuff they used to make nuclear bombs. Exactly. The discovery of uranium opened up incredible possibilities for energy production. Right. But it also unleashed the potential for devastating destruction. A very powerful metaphor for the double-edged sword of scientific progress. Exactly. So are you saying that we're like that type zero civilization? standing on the brink of either a technological utopia or a nuclear apocalypse. Those are pretty high stakes. Well, in a way, yes, we've unlocked incredible knowledge and technological power, but we haven't necessarily figured out how to wield it wisely. And that, according to Dr. Kaku, is the defining challenge of our time. So what's the solution? How do we navigate this treacherous path between progress and self-destruction? That's a pretty big question. It is a big one. And it's a question that Dr. Kaku, he, uh, he doesn't pretend to have all the answers to. But he does offer some guidance. Oh. He stresses the importance of open dialogue, critical thinking, and a willingness to question our assumptions. So basically, we need to approach these complex issues with both a sense of wonder and a healthy dose of skepticism. Mm. We can't let our excitement about new technologies blind us to the potential risks. Exactly. And we need to engage in these thoughtful, nuanced conversations about the ethical implications of our scientific advancements. Right. We can't just leave these decisions to scientists and engineers. They need to involve the broader public, philosophers, ethicists, policymakers, you name it. It's a collective responsibility. Absolutely. It's a reminder that science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. It's intertwined with our values, our beliefs, our hopes for the future. It's all connected. It really is. And it's up to all of us to ensure that our pursuit of knowledge leads us towards a brighter future, not to a dystopian nightmare. Wait, what? Welcome back for the final part of our deep dive into the mind of Dr. Miki Okaku. I'm ready for more mind-blowing insights. Me too. We've covered so much ground already. From hyperspace to black holes to genetic engineering. It's been quite a journey. But there's one more topic I want to dig into before we wrap things up. What's that? A search for extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI. Ah, yes. The quest to find out if we're alone in the universe. We touched on it briefly before, but I think it deserves a deeper dive. Especially considering Dr. Kaku's unique perspective on it. Exactly. He's got some pretty strong opinions about how we're going about 
searching for alien civilizations. And he's not afraid to challenge the status quo. Not at all. Uh -huh. Remember, he said that our current SETI methods are primitive and anthropocentric. Right. As if aliens would necessarily communicate the way we do. It's like we're shouting English phrases into a crowded room. And hoping that someone will understand us, even if they don't speak English. Exactly. It's a very limited approach. It might be severely limiting our chances of success. So what does Dr. Kaku suggest we do instead? Well, he says that instead of focusing solely on radio signals, we should be looking for other signs of advanced technology. Like what? Things that could manipulate energy on a grand scale. Give me an example. Dyson spheres. What Dyson spheres? Hypothetical megastructures built around stars to capture their energy. Whoa. So like a giant solar panel surrounding an entire star. Basically. Or even the manipulation of space-time itself. Okay, now we're talking. Creating wormholes or other distortions that we could potentially detect. Mm -hmm. So we should be looking for cosmic scale engineering projects, not just faint radio whispers. That makes sense, especially if we're talking about civilizations that are thousands or even millions of years ahead of us technologically. Right. He uses this brilliant analogy from physics called the Fourier transform to illustrate this point. Okay, break that down for me. I'm not a physicist. Imagine taking a complex symphony and spreading it out across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So instead of a concentrated sound, it's diffused across a wide range of frequencies. Exactly. Making it virtually undetectable unless you know exactly what you're looking for and how to reassemble the signal. It's like trying to hear a single conversation in a stadium filled with people talking. Almost impossible, unless you have some way of filtering out all that background noise. A perfect analogy. Advanced civilizations might be using similar techniques, making their signals incredibly difficult to detect with our current technology. So we could be surrounded by alien civilizations, but we're essentially deaf to their communications because we're listening with the wrong ears. It's a humbling thought, it's a reminder that the universe is full of mysteries that we're only just beginning to grasp. And it's a call to be more creative and open-minded in our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So what you're saying is that instead of just listening for radio signals, we need to start thinking bigger, bolder, and more outside the box. Absolutely. We need to consider the possibility that advanced civilizations might be using technologies and energy sources that are far beyond our current comprehension. It's enough to make your head spin. It is. But even as we ponder the vastness of the cosmos and the possibility of alien civilizations, it's important to remember that the most profound mysteries might be right here on Earth, within ourselves. You're talking about the nature of consciousness, right? That age-old question of what it means to be human. Exactly. To experience the world, to feel emotions, to have this sense of self. It's a mystery that has baffled philosophers and scientists for centuries. And even with all our technological advancements, we're still no closer to a definitive answer. It's a mystery that continues to fascinate us. It really does. Does Dr. Kaku offer any insights into this mystery? He doesn't claim to have all the answers, but he does offer some thought-provoking ideas. He suggests that consciousness might be an emergent property of complex systems. Emergent property. It means that consciousness could arise from the interaction of many simpler parts, not just be limited to biological brains. Much like a flock of birds exhibits complex behavior, even though each individual bird is following relatively simple rules. So you're saying that consciousness might not be limited to biological organisms? It could potentially exist in other forms, like, I don't know, advanced artificial intelligence, or even in the universe itself. That's one of the possibilities Dr. Kaku explores. He suggests that the universe might be a self-aware entity with consciousness woven into the very fabric of space-time. Whoa. A conscious universe. That's a mind-blowing concept. It really is. It makes you question everything you thought you knew about reality. It certainly pushes the boundaries of our understanding. But that's the beauty of exploring these big existential questions, isn't it? They challenge us to think beyond our limited perspective. And embrace the mystery and wonder of the universe. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on. We've covered a lot of ground in our deep dive into the mind of Dr. Mikio Kaku from the mind-bending possibilities of hyperspace and time travel to the profound questions about the nature of consciousness and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's been an incredible journey, a testament to Dr. Kaku's ability to make these complex scientific concepts accessible and thought-provoking. As we conclude this deep dive, I want to leave you with a final thought. Never stop questioning, exploring, and imagining. The universe is full of mysteries waiting to be unraveled, and it's up to each of us 
to contribute to the ongoing quest for knowledge and understanding. So keep your minds open, your curiosity alive, and never lose your sense of wonder. Until next time, keep exploring the possibilities.